Congratulations, lovely reader. You've discovered the Dark and Stormy Book Club podcast. This is Janelle Patrick, the author of The Last Tea Bowl Thief, wishing you happy listening and happy reading. Hello, and welcome to episode 177 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today, we devote an entire episode to a wonderful book called The Lost Apothecary. Enjoy. I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. We just read the most amazing book and thought we would do a full review, The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. A female apothecary secretly dispenses poisons to liberate women from the men who have wronged them. Setting three lives across centuries on a dangerous collision course, Rule 1, the poison must never be used to harm another woman. Rule two, the names of the murderer and the victim must be recorded in the apothecary's register. One cold February evening in 1791 at the back of a dark London alley in a hidden apothecary shop, Nella awaits her newest customer. Once a respected healer, Nella now uses her knowledge for the darker purpose, selling well-disguised poisons to desperate women who would kill to be free of the men of their lives. But when her new patron turns out to be a precocious 12-year-old named Eliza Fanning, an unexpected friendship sets in motion a string of events that jeopardizes Nella's world and threatens to expose the many women whose names are written in the register. In present-day London, aspiring historian Caroline Parswell spends her 10th wedding anniversary alone, reeling from the discovery of her husband's infidelity when she finds an old apothecary vial near the River Thames. She can't resist investigating, only realizing she's found a link to unsolved apothecary murders that haunts London over two centuries ago. As she deepens her search, Caroline's life collides with Nella's and Eliza's, in a stunning twist of fate, and not everyone will survive. Oh, can you see why we thought it was so good? The word apothecary is evocative. It draws forth visions of a candlelit storefront with sash windows, walls lined with mortar bowls and pestles, and countless glass bottles. There's something beguiling, even enchanting, about what might lie within those bottles. Potions that can bewitch us, cure us, kill us. When describing Nella's hidden shop, the author did her best to capture this allure. Indeed, many contemporary retail shops are doing the same, and it seems most cities now have some sort of apothecary shop selling cosmetics for natural recipes. How about that? I think we should start by going over some of the main characters in the book so you get to know who we're talking about here. What I did was I separated these out by the past and present. So we'll start with the past. The first character is Eliza Fanning. She's a 12-year-old peasant girl who first employee taught her how to read and write. She gets sent on a mission to get some poison from the apothecary. Eliza's visit to the apothecary starts another path to this story. And then we have Nella. She is the owner of the apothecary. Nella Clavenger is her full name. She owns the apothecary and has a tragic past. She lost a child when she was a younger woman. She so desperately wanted to become a mother. And you will notice in this book that pregnancy and motherhood are a theme that run through this book. 
And then we have Lady Clarence, who enlists Nella to help in providing a poison. But this opens another door that Nella does not want to go through. Based on the rules that we told you in the beginning. So we'll leave you with that. Now we're going to jump to the present. And our main protagonist in this book is Caroline Parswell. And she finds out her husband of 10 years is cheating on her. So she decides to go on their big anniversary trip to London by herself. James is her husband. He doesn't play a huge role in this till you get towards the end of the book. But he gets mentioned a lot. And then you've got Gaynor, who is a librarian historian who helps Caroline in her quest to find this apothecary. Those are your main characters. There's other minor characters, but they don't play a huge part in the story. But even though this book is told in two timelines, I felt it was never confusing. I agree. It was easy to tell them apart. But I will say, I did look forward to the chapters in the past just a little bit more, but I felt that the alternating ones in the present were cleverly in line with what was going on in the past. I thought Sarah Penner did a great job with that. It's funny because until a couple of years ago, I had never heard the term mudlarking, even though Anne will go more into that, until we interviewed Bonnie McBird and she started talking about her next book in the series. She talked about Watson going mudlarking. I don't know if our audience knows what that term means. Anne, would you like to explain what mudlarking is? Along the Thames River in London, this river runs right through the city, and it has been there since before London existed. If you go to the edge of the river, usually with a group because they know where to look, and the tide is out, you can find history hidden in the mud. When you walk along, you kind of shuffle your feet, you find historical things that have been there since eons. When we went, there was a Victorian piece of a bowl that got everybody excited. But then there were also pieces of mortar from buildings, buttons, scissors, Coins. you name it. If it can exist in water without eroding, you can find it. I mean, they've found ships. They've found toys. The man who ran the mud larking center that I went with. They have a small museum with the finds that they have authenticated from 1600s before the Great Fire of London. It's really amazing, number one, that these things still exist. I would love to do that. If I ever get to London, I'm definitely going to be a mud larker. <laughs> well, it's very tricky. You have to go certain times. When the tide comes back in, you're sunk in the mud. So that doesn't sound like fun. No. Well, anyway, the reason why it's important you know that part of the story is that's kind of what gets the ball rolling for Carolyn to go on this quest. She doesn't set out to go mud larking, but she gets invited and she doesn't have a whole lot to do there, so she decides to go. She finds this vial in the mud with a strange marking on it. She, more historical literature was her background. So she's very intrigued by this and goes on this journey to try to find out what this vial is. That's when she ends up meeting Gaynor at the British Library. Gaynor is the sister of the mudlarker. And she could help her research this bottle that she found. Gainer is game. She goes and looks up all these different... A lot of maps. I find that stuff very interesting. And I don't know if everybody thinks old maps are interesting, but I do. Caroline finds directions to the apothecary shop. Now, this apothecary shop, even though I read a description, is not like your normal apothecary shop. It's an old building with a hidden entrance. Nella sits behind this fake wall and waits for people to enter. She judges whether she will help them or not. She has to hear their story, and one of the things she has is a register. Her mother was an apothecary also. Her mother was a wonderful healer. She kept a register of everyone she had helped, the medicine that she gave them. 
Now, Nella's specialty is sort of on the dark side. She is using her skills to help women who were in dire straits. Some women had six children. They did not want to get pregnant again. We need a medicine. Something that modern day women do not have to worry about. That's right. That's right. In the old days, I think Nella would have been considered a witch. Yeah, I kind of felt that too. She was not accepted as a healer. It was hard for men to accept that women were capable of anything. Right, of anything but having babies. And one of the things that she does best is prepare poisons. If your husband was a philanderer, <laughs> give him a little dose of poison. That's how she meets Eliza. Eliza is sent by Lady Clarence to get some poison. Now she learns very quickly. Lady Clarence wants the poison to kill her husband's mistress. Yes. Not her husband. And you remember the rules we went over. And it never <laughs> harm a woman. Nella is put in a position. She's damned if she does, and yeah, she's it's damned really, if she doesn't. And we won't go into too much detail because we really want you to read this book. It's not as easy as just, okay, I'm not going to kill this woman. Right. But then the author did a wonderful job of finding out about the old-fashioned cures. She definitely did her homework. I don't know where she got her information, but I was blown away by some of it. She also knows which plants are toxic, even many household plants. Eucalyptus oil is a poison. If yeah, it's, well, we see that at the end. If it's eaten. I do want to stress, because I think this is important, this is not a how-to get no, your no. spouse book. And I think Sarah did also a great job of showing the consequences of some of these actions. Right. It's entirely possible that an apothecary shop like Nella's could exist in the 19th century. Until the mid-1800s, death examiners were not able to detect poison. It all just looked like natural causes. When they did autopsies, poisons were very rarely even thought of. But historical records say toxic compounds like arsenic, Nux vomitus, mercury, and opium were readily available at your regular store. Well, it was used for other purposes other than what we think of them as being poison. Yeah, they were used throughout the house, like arsenic was used for rat poison. It was interesting when you find out that after the 1800s, they started coloring arsenic blue so that they could see it. If it was in the patient, it left a residue. Caroline finally discovers where this apothecary is. Because this yeah. is 100 years yeah. later. This is where you almost have to dispel some belief here. And this is just my opinion. I really find it hard to believe that there would be a building that... Especially yeah, in London. Yeah, I mean... Come on, Hitler bombed the crap out of London. <laughs> I don't think there'd be much of a building underneath something that... When I went to London, they are always building something. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe that Bear Alley <laughs> still existed. Now, there are many historical sites that they've maintained. It didn't make me not like the book. I no. just rolled my eyes a few times. <laughs> also, the fact that she found Nella's register. I mean, that was written in 1800. It's possible that the book existed sure, and still sure. exists, but it's not going to be in a little room with a fake wall. I almost consider this a slight fantasy book, even though it's a fiction book. It's not like it's true. I consider it something that you have to brush that aside but and still really enjoy the story. Because I really loved everything about this book. I did, too. It was a wonderful book to read. It was funny in a few places. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was thrilling and suspenseful. You didn't know what was going to happen. It has little twists. I won't tell you what they are. The story doesn't end with 
this event.